are going to bring more questions and issues to our discussion. So an important part this afternoon will be the questions you asked and the uh, exchange of information that we have. There's going to be times this afternoon when I'm going to say, I don't know the answer, but uh, perhaps somebody in the crew will be able to uh, offer some thoughts for all of us to take home. So please don't hesitate to uh, raise some questions, share some ideas. Uh, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions, obviously. We're not going to be able to get into the very detailed personal questions that some of you might have. But hopefully we'll be able to uh, walk away from this whenever we finish up, whether that's an hour from now or hour and a half from now, or maybe you're done in 15 minutes from now. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to walk away with some ideas. This afternoon's presentations already have us understanding the impact of the technology that the oil industry is using and that the technology has certainly changed in the past several years. Certainly is different than it was several decades ago when the first oil was produced in North Dakota. And as suggested by Gene, there's going to continue to be technology evolving and impacting how the oil industry advances. No different than what all of us have experienced with agriculture. You think about how the technology has changed on our farms and our ranches, how we expect that technology to keep on changing, how that has impacted how we operate our businesses, what it means to the resources that we use. Um, these people in the oil industry are no different than the business people in the egg industry. The same things that motivate you are probably the same values, the same goals or similar goals that motivate other business people, including the oil industry. So give that some consideration. As you look at your industry of agriculture, and I'm making the assumption that nearly all of us have some involvement with agriculture this afternoon, and then you think about how the energy industry is changing, um, it, it's an exciting time to be involved with both the food industry of agriculture as well as the energy industry. Let me see which button does this computer want me to use? I can see me have the that one? Oh, okay. Again, we've already talked about the technology, the horizontal drilling, the fracking, the transportation, the flaring of the gas, the disposing of the brine, uh, the multiple wells per pad, the pipeline infrastructure. I've heard an estimate that there's going to need to be about 8,000 miles of pipe to connect the wells in our several counties here. Uh, that's a lot of pipelines to be built. So as we've already seen, the projections of the labor uh, that will be in here for perhaps the next five to ten years, that we're not only drilling the well, but we're building the infrastructure. Uh, again, I don't need to repeat what we've already seen this afternoon, but we need to keep those ideas in mind. So what have we seen the past several years? We've seen a rush to get that first well drilled on a spacing unit. We've already been introduced to the concept of a spacing unit this afternoon. We have divided this region into 1,280 acres, one mile by two miles, and the technology allows us essentially to set a well at the one end of that two mile strip of land, go ahead, drill down until we hit the strata or the formation with the oil, the oil bearing shale, turn horizontally. I'm still not quite sure how they bend pipes, but obviously they do it and then you drill another two miles horizontally. Uh, once that first well is drilled into that 1,280 acres, that oil company now essentially controls that spacing unit. So we had a mad rush by the oil industry to figure out which spacing units are we going to be able to get that first well into, can we get it drilled, can we get it operating, uh, so that we now control that spacing unit. And as also explained already this afternoon, most of those spacing units have that first well. Now we're going to come on back and put in those additional wells, anywhere from another five to seven wells per spacing unit, probably. Um, yeah, 
Our family land is just a small track. It's in eastern Dunn County, and it's right outside the gray area. I'm not retiring early. <laughs> We've seen these types of maps already this afternoon. The, west, the left edge, the western edge, uh, represents the wells of the technology of several decades ago. The eastern region here has the technology that we're using today where the horizontal drilling, see Lake Sakakawea there. Um, and as already illustrated by some of our other speakers, we have some of these well pads where uh, there's multiple wells at uh, the single pad and we're producing as many as two spacing units or uh, four square miles worth of area off of one well pad. In the future, we'll be drilling deeper. That's already been described this afternoon, going into other formations. On, and then the question is, are we going to be going beyond the current oil field? Well, that's already been answered this afternoon as well. Um, probably not for a little while. Uh, somebody was saying the other day that they thought they saw an oil rig in Grand Forks County. Uh, I think that was wishful thinking. <laughs> it's, as Jane indicated, and as the maps have shown us, as the public information is available on the website, we know where this production is concentrated, and you people are in the middle of it. There's going to be several topics for us to discuss this afternoon, and the topics deal with how we interact with each other. What are some of the questions that arise between us as we have these interactions? Who's going to have the interactions? Well, there's going to be the interaction between the mineral owner and the mineral developer, as the title of this slide suggests. In a few moments, we're going to have a slide that is titled the, Between the Surface Owner and the Mineral Owner, when the minerals have been severed and there's going to be some issues in that relationship. And then the third type of relationship that we'll be talking about this afternoon, you'll be asking questions about, and I'll try to see if I can answer a few of them, is between the mineral developer and the surface owner. So we have these three different types of relationships that I would ask us to think about this afternoon. <coughs> Why use these categories? Well, I have to use these categories try to keep my own thinking straight. Uh, so as you ask the question, my first reaction is, okay, which of these three categories does that particular question relate to? Uh, so that's the only reason why I suggest that we uh, use these sort of ways of trying to organize our questions. Otherwise, we're going to be popping all over the place. So the first one that I would ask us to think about this afternoon are the types of questions that arise between a mineral owner and a mineral developer. And the, that relationship is essentially the mineral lease. Uh, there are some areas of the state where mineral leasing has not yet occurred. Will it occur? Well, again, that's a projection as to how large is this oil development going to be in the near future. If it's going to take a little while for the oil development to go beyond these uh, several counties where it's occurring at this time, um, there's not going to be a lot of mineral leasing in those other areas. Uh, others would say a lot of the minerals have already been leased in this area where the oil development is mature, using the terminology that uh, Dale introduced us to this afternoon. So I uh, don't know if we have a lot of questions about mineral leasing today. Some people might say, golly, we should have talked about mineral leasing several years ago because that's when that was the hottest topic. But I do understand that there are some mineral leases expiring and that particular spacing unit may not have yet been developed. So there's an opportunity for some uh, mineral owners to enter into an updated mineral lease at this time. So there might be a few questions. Uh, but again, we're trying to set the relationship between the mineral owner and the mineral developer. Certainly, we're still determining the ownership of our mineral rights. A lot of those mineral rights have been determined. Uh, yeah, there's some very small fractions as families have held on to the minerals and allowed it to pass to the next generation and 
Sometimes it passed to the next generation without people even knowing about it. So we're going through a sorting out process and trying to figure out who owns these minerals. Again, many of you perhaps have experienced that in the last several years, so we probably don't have to spend a lot of time with it. But I'll just share a very quick experience that I had last August. A lady came to my office and she said that she had been contacted by a, an oil company. The oil company was trying to figure out who owns the mineral rights. Uh, she didn't know anything about it. They said, well, it looks like your grandfather owned the minerals on about 160 acres out there in about the recall now was Williams County or McKenzie County. Uh, and if our calculations are right, you own eight acres, the equivalent of eight acres out of that. So uh, you get a, well, do the math, eight acres out of a 1,280 acre spacing unit, that begins to be the, your interest in this oil well, by the way, that's already producing. So uh, she was pleasantly surprised to find out that she had some interest in a producing oil well, or at least mineral interest, um, was much to her surprise. So we're still trying to figure out who owns these minerals. At this point, I'm going to stop. It's your turn to start asking some questions. Do you have some questions? Go ahead, sir. Well, apparently you've done quite a little research under ownership of minerals. What, what's your interpretation of gross ownership? Gross ownership? Yeah. I'm not sure if I've ever heard that term before. In what context have you heard or seen that term? Well, in our, our title opinion, uh, it said that gross ownership means the minerals have to stay with the landowner. It's our state law, and if the original owner cannot, I believe it's sell, convey, or that there's three things, and, and it's only for your lifetime that they can be um, held for, for income, and that's our law. And, and most people don't know that. I'm not familiar with that statute. Yeah, you need to look it up. Um, I'd welcome a citation on that. <clears throat> Did your uh, legal opinion include a citation to that law? We have a couple laws in the phone. Okay. Um, okay. I didn't do very well. Flunked my first question. <laughs> 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 so I want to answer to the idea that pursued all the have? No. Next question. Let's see if I can do any better the next time around. You're doing pretty good at stumping me, so one out of one. Let's see if we can get two out of two. Okay. Um, we've got a parcel of land, no minerals underneath it. It's, it's kind of a typical scenario. Uh, oil company comes in and they want to build an oil pad, and they offer you this dollar amount. Okay, as we understand, as a surface owner, I have to accept whatever the heck they're offering me. You don't I'm, have to, but... Okay, then what happens when I don't? I, I, won't, I won't sign their lease, let's put it that way. Now, first of all, you're taking us to the third category, <laughs> which is fine. But we'll just ask one more time, are there any questions on this first category before we jump to the third category? Because I would expect that's where we're going to spend most of our time this afternoon, is between the mineral developer and the surface owner. I think that's where we're going to have most of our discussion this afternoon. But one more time before we hop to category three, are there any questions on category one, where it's between the mineral developer and the mineral owner? Yeah. Uh, just as we're signing these leases with that clue clause in that, that usually gives them another six months uh, after the end of the lease to still drill. And um, we can also go with vertical clue clauses also. Yes. And those are some points to be talking about. Is uh, Which mineral rights are we leasing? And these mineral leases are entirely negotiable. There might be times when somebody says, well, this document that I'm presenting to you is a standard mineral lease. Yeah, uh, the reaction is there is no such thing as a standard mineral lease. So don't hesitate to negotiate. 
just like you negotiate when you lease your farmland or whatever else that you're negotiating, don't hesitate to negotiate on the mineral lease. If you want to negotiate, trying to, people have successfully done it, divide your mineral interest by formations. I'll lease to you the right to develop the minerals in this formation. So now you're going to have to do a little bit of studying to understand the ge geology of your minerals so that you can intelligently and appropriately specify that formation. Then that implies that you have reserved the minerals on the lower formation. So if another mineral company comes to you and says, we'd like to rent to lease your minerals, and we recognize that we're not going to be able to produce the minerals on the upper formation because that goes to company A already, go ahead, you can <coughs> lease out the minerals on a lower formation, and you can stratify your mineral interest. Or you can try to do it. You can try to do it. It's negotiable. Why would you want to do that? You still have 20 rigs on your land. Why do you want to do it? There are the downsides. Are you going to have more drilling on your land? Oh, yeah. Maybe. You're going to have that same drilling anyway. But it does give you a chance to say, if the minerals are being developed at the 10,000 foot level today, and they're not going to be developed at the 17,000 foot level for another decade, come on back when you're ready to talk about the 17,000 foot level sometime yeah. in the future. Or it'll hold the lease for 50 years, like you just said. Yeah. Uh, so, the first one. Well, it's negotiable. Some of you are going to walk out of here saying, no, I'm just going to lease it once, and I'm going to have it leased because I think there's downside of trying to stratify my mineral interests. Others are going to walk out of here saying, well, that's something for me to think about. Maybe I at least look into it a little bit more before I make that decision. So I'm not going to say do it one way or the other. I'm not going to debate with you do it one way or the other. I'm just going to try to make sure that all of us are recognized that we have these opportunities. Yes. Who says the company that you don't lease in a blank lease to it doesn't go and sell zones to other companies? If you and make profit off your lease. Oh, they're going to do that. They're going to if you if one company was to lease all of your minerals from the surface of the earth to the center of the earth, and legally you own from the surface of the earth to the center of the earth. Actually Legally, you own from the sky to the center of the earth. That's right. When you own a tract of land, you own as high as the heavens extend <coughs> to the center of the earth. So if you lease out the minerals, you can rest assured that whoever's leasing it is going to be a business person just like you. When you lease something from somebody else, you look for profit opportunities. The mineral companies are going to be no different. They're going to look for profit opportunities. And if their profit opportunity is to release, what's the hyphen in there? The uh, minerals at the 17,000 foot level, that's just the hypothetical number I'm pulling out, and they're going to lease that to company B, that's part of doing business. No different than the way we do business when we farm or ranch. Other questions or comments? Like I said before, you didn't hear me, were, you're four years late. I was told that yesterday as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Even though we're four years late, we uh, need to be mindful that we are clearly producing more than just crude oil, that the natural gas is almost as equally important, some situations perhaps more important than the crude oil. You have an opportunity to negotiate a mineral lease, be thinking of both the crude oil and the details that go into an agreement on the crude oil that's being produced, and then another paragraph in the mineral lease where you think about the natural gas. Uh, why the difference? The natural gas, as been discussed this afternoon, is going to be transported by pipeline. And it needs to be processed. It needs to be processed before it even reaches the major pipelines. 
And that processing obviously includes a cost. And one of the questions is, who bears the cost of processing that natural gas so that it's ready to be included into the pipelines? Negotiate that into your mineral lease the best you can. Clarify who is paying that processing cost for the natural gas. Uh, try to specify a market where you will be pricing that natural gas. Uh, natural gas just brings in some details that don't necessarily become issues when you are thinking about crude oil. Uh, so when you, if you look at leases, you're looking at some leases as sample leases to help you think about the lease that you might want to negotiate and enter into. Be mindful that you try to address both the crude oil as well as the natural gas. Questions or comments? Yes. Uh, it seems like on the slide before that, probably kind of missed the last uh, part of that where it says uh, the question was about decisions not to lease. In the 80s, we got legislation through that uh, you didn't have to lease and you could participate in 16% royalty is, is the basis for the minimum royalty. Correct. And so there's a few people that didn't get the terms that they wanted, so they didn't lease yep. and participate. Yep. And you can be a partial owner. You essentially are a partner in that um, well. Yes. Or non-participating. They can't force us either to come up with money to be in with them. Well, like see but they, but they, they can't force you to come up with the money, but then you pay a penalty in terms of how much you yeah, receive. And that's okay. Yeah, okay. So these are decisions that mineral owners need to make, need to consider their options as they then make these decisions. Other questions? I saw another question in the back. Yes. I'm just going to say that I had a landowner, mineral owner, tell me that in his lease, he gets paid for the natural gas whether they're declaring it or it's in the pipeline. Good for him. Good. Yeah. Let's see. Right. That's what I'm just saw. Let him flare. You know, from a mineral owner's perspective, uh, from a community member's perspective, I'd say good for him. So. Other questions or comments? Over here. Go ahead. Has, I, I've heard this, don't know if it's accurate or not, but has anybody been successful in negotiating a lease where you don't allow flaring of the natural gas? The question is, has anybody been successful in including a provision in a mineral lease that prohibits flaring? Do we know of any such uh, mineral lease. I'm not aware of such a mineral lease. Maybe somebody else in the room may want to come. Up. No, I'm going to guess that that probably means that uh, flaring usually is going to be occurring at least initially. Other questions or comments? Very briefly then, the second category is are there questions between the mineral owner and the surface owner? Uh, just have a couple of points. Uh, it's well established that the mineral estate dominates over the surface estate, even though people sometimes shake their head wondering how that ever came about. Uh, that idea probably arose a century ago, or even several centuries ago, that the mineral estate dominates over the surface estate, which essentially means my own the mineral rights, I can come on to your land even though you own the surface, so that I can develop my minerals. Uh, North Dakota does have a statute in place that allows the surface owner to uh, claim ownership of the severed mineral rights if the mineral owner hasn't uh, used those minerals in the past 20 years. Essentially, the mineral's interest has been unused for 20 years or more, it's considered abandoned, and then the surface owner can go ahead and initiate a process to try to acquire ownership of those minerals. Uh, part of the process is that the surface owner needs to try to identify who is the mineral owner, needs to try to 
contact the mineral owner, inform the mineral owner that this process has been initiated, and clearly if the mineral owner then receives that uh, information or that notification from the surface owner, the mineral owner often tries to ask the question that, well, what do I need to do to hold on to my mineral rights? But we do have this law in North Dakota. Uh, other states have similar statute. Other states have litigated it and say, yes, this is a constitutional uh, law. And therefore, people in North Dakota are saying, we're going to re arguably rely on the other states that is constitutional here in North Dakota as well. Uh, there are those who also argue, though, that this law really is unconstitutional and it shouldn't be you know, enforced. Uh, it has not, I don't believe it's been litigated in North Dakota. I know it has been litigated in other states. So, second category then is between the mineral owner and surface owner. Questions or comments? Go ahead. Can only the uh, surface owner apply for the units? Yes. Okay, what happens, say the oil company can't find all those mineral owners, you know, down to small pieces. What happens to that money? That money is held in trust. So then the surface owner at some point, if he discovered that, could go after it? No. The statute is clear, you don't get to go after those. Sure. Instead, it's going to be held in trust. Portion of it goes to the county, and eventually the rest of it goes to the state. Oh. Is there anything happening in the legislature currently that would change this law? I'm not following the legislation right now. It keeps me too busy to try to follow the legislature. I wait until they're done, and then I figure out what they did. Uh, is there somebody else in the group here that's following some of the proposals in the legislature at this time? I, have, I haven't seen any. I, haven't, I don't think that's, I haven't seen that. Bill come across. Okay. And we're close, and in fact, we're past filing dates. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's go to the third category. The question that was asked a few moments ago and we didn't answer. When we have a dispute between the surface owner and the mineral developer, the mineral developer is coming onto the land, is uh, disrupting the surface activities, where are we at? Uh, North Dakota law requires compensation for the surface impacts. We have those statutes. We're going to look at them in a little bit of detail this afternoon. Uh, we're going to probably discover that those statutes don't answer all the questions, but at least they're a start. I understand that there are bills in front of this legislative session to refine some of these statutes. And again, there's probably some of you in this room that are following it much closer than I am at this time, but at least look at where we were at the end of our 2011 session and then be ready for what might still come out of our 2013 session. We also have North Dakota Mediation Service, which is part of the North Dakota Department of Ag, and the legislature has tasked the Mediation Service with, well, the responsibilities that they've had since the 1980s, but they have added, the legislature's added to those responsibilities to also help resolve some of these disputes or uncertainties between uh, the surface owner and the mineral developer. So uh, we do have a mediation service to help us negotiate or resolve some of these uh, unanswered questions if we're unable to resolve them between ourselves and the mineral developer directly. Uh, we know that the pipelines are coming. We know that the easements are necessary for these pipelines, and they are going to be raising, uh, my expectation to be raising many more questions uh, in the near future. Is there eminent domain to that the pipeline companies can force the property owner to give up an easement for a pipeline? Uh, yes, no, I, I think that one's still to be answered. Uh, can we negotiate? Yes, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to negotiate. And then if the negotiations aren't successful, do we then use something like the mediation services again? Probably should have a fourth sub-point at the very bottom here, and that is um, when the negotiations fall apart, you go to the court. That was a point that was discussed several times yesterday in Crosby. Uh, the ultimate resolution, even though it can be expensive and time-consuming, is through a court proceeding. So 
We'll keep going for a few moments, but be ready to ask some questions. The North Dakota statute says that the surface owner is to be compensated for lost value, interrupted production. Some people would ask, is this statute in North Dakota really offering the protection that we would like it to offer? There are other states that don't have this type of a statute. And I would suggest in those other states that there's even less protection for the surface owner. For example, because the mineral estate dominates over the surface estate, there are states that interpret that concept to mean that the mineral developer can enter onto the property, develop the minerals, and there is no obligation by the mineral developer to compensate the surface owner. In some of those states, the only time that the law requires compensation is if the mineral developer has caused unreasonable, whatever that means, has caused unreasonable damages. Uh, North Dakota's statutes that we have in place certainly offers more protection for our surface owners than in those other states. North Dakota, we're trying to say surface owners are entitled to be compensated. Okay? Looking at the statutes in a little more detail. These are the current statutes. These are the statutes as of 2011. They might be quite different by the time we get done with the 2013 session. As of now, the statute talks about damage and disruption. A mineral developer pays the surface owner for damages sustained by the surface owner and the tenant. That was one of the questions yesterday in Crosby. Well, can the surface tenant try to negotiate with the mineral developer? Now, while you look at this statute, it's pretty clear. It's the surface owner that negotiates with the mineral developer. And the surface owner negotiates on behalf of the surface owner as well as the surface operator, the tenant. And there is concerns about, well, that surface owner might be an absentee landowner in Minneapolis that doesn't understand or appreciate all of the interruptions and the impacts of mineral development on the surface use. The person who understands that is the tenant. So surface owner, you're going to need to be talking to the tenant. Tenants, you're going to be need, needing to talk to the surface owner. Uh, we'll see that addressed again by the North Dakota Legislature in just a few moments. So what type of damages is the surface owner to be compensated for under this North Dakota statute? Lost land value, lost use of and access to the surface owner's land, lost value of improvements caused by the drilling operations. Well, if you look at those three categories of losses, there's probably some other losses there that are impacts that aren't arguably incorporated or encompassed in those three categories. Um, dust off of the public road in front of my farmstead. I don't think that one fits in those three. And you probably come up with some other examples. So even this relatively broad language, maybe it isn't as broad as it looks, uh, certainly doesn't include all the type of impacts. What do we mean by drilling operations? <coughs> this statute applies to only drilling operations. Drilling operations and drilling an oil or gas well, subsequent production and completion operations, and oil and gas exploration activities. Well, there's some things that mineral developers do that might not fit the definition of a drilling operation. And if those activities don't fit the definition of a drilling operation, then arguably this statute doesn't protect the surface owner for those other type of activities. So the statute isn't quite as broad as it might look at initially. The amount of damages to be determined by mutual agreement between the surface owner and the mineral developer. Those are the two parties that the legislature anticipates doing the negotiating. 
The payments are to compensate the surface owner for damage and disruption. These payments only cover land directly affected by drilling operations. So my land's adjacent, my land's being impacted, but the drilling operation isn't directly on my land. Um, arguably, this statute doesn't apply. So the statute might not be quite as encompassing again as it might uh, look at first blush. Only one payment for damages caused by expiration, multiple payments, multiple years for uh, other damages. So that's one of the two statutes. The other one statute talks about loss of production. The mineral developer pays the surface owner for damages sustained by the surface owner and the tenant for loss of agricultural production caused by oil and gas production and completion operations. Agricultural production is quite broadly defined in this statute. The amount of damages may be determined by mutual agreement. Again, between the surface owner and the mineral developer. Payments are to compensate the surface owner for loss of production. Payments for loss of production must be made annually unless the surface owner elects only one payment. So you have an opportunity to have these payments each year for however many years. Um, it doesn't say that you get to renegotiate them every year. It just says you get to receive the payment every year. For both types of damages, if there is no agreement between the surface owner and the farming tenant, as to the division of the compensation, the legislature says the tenant is entitled to be compensated. Um, so the legislature says there needs to be some compensation somehow because it's going to be the tenant, the surface operator, that's going to be impacted. It's, it's, a smaller field, it's uh, an irregularly shaped field, it's uh, a pathway or a roadway across the land or through the pasture. So the legislature is trying to make sure it's clear that surface owners, you have some responsibility to that surface operator or to the tenant. The person offered compensation may accept or reject any offer. And I think that was one of the comments that was leading up to the question a few moments ago. If the person rejects the offer from the mineral developer, that person can then bring a court action. It's seldom that the legislature includes language in a statute that says, uh, well, people, if you can't come up with a solution, sue each other. Um, but it, it's pretty clear with the language in this particular statute as it sits as of today, uh, if people can't come to an agreement, a mutual agreement that you both can live with, um, the legislature makes it clear that they, they, it recognizes the only solution then is to bring in the attorneys and use the legal system, use the courts. Okay, let's go ahead with questions and comments. Go ahead, Dale. I was just going to say, you mentioned earlier about the uh, mediation service through the Department of Ag. Would that apply in this particular case if the surface owner didn't agree to the surface compensation thing that the agreement that the oil company was offering? Can that go to ag mediation or mediation, I guess it would be? And would that hold any standing or would it still end up in the hope is that if the two parties can't come to an agreement themselves, try someone else to maybe help negotiate that agreement, such as the mediation service. Uh, the mediation service is a mandatory. If one of the parties wants to involve the mediation service and the other party doesn't want to cooperate, the negotiations fall apart there, and then you're down to the last resort of the courtroom. If the parties are willing to use the mediation service and that mediation, the discussions facilitated by the mediation service is successful that the parties can come to some type of an agreement, good for everybody involved. Other questions? Yes. Can the State Dust Commission tell you if there's wells drilled on state school land, can they tell you which direction the lake might go? 
Yes. Uh, you can, first of all, look at the map that we were showing this afternoon that shows where the lake is located. And if you want more detailed information, the Industrial Commission has that information. It's, it's detailed. That is public information. Where those wells are located, where those horizontal bores are drilled, um, that's all public information. Yes? Uh, in the case of this mediation situation, uh, uh, how much of mediation can you in this situation of landowner mineral developer? When I this, minerals? When, when I have visited with the people at the Department of Ag, they only give general responses. They haven't given me any specific numbers. I haven't asked for specific numbers. Their comments are, it's increasing. And there, a year ago, uh, about a year ago, uh, when I visited with the Department of Ag about this responsibility, their response at that time was, we're getting ourselves ready for it. Because it was a new responsibility and they needed to get themselves prepped that they understood the subject so they would be meaningful uh, mediators. So we're starting at a very low base as about a year and a half ago and, and it, it's slowly increasing. But the mediation service is very serious about that this is their responsibility and they want to be available. They're well, still learning. For example, in McKenzie County, you know, an awful lot of the acres is owned by a railroad grant. You know, for minerals. So the minerals. Off, severed off, you know, surface owners. Right. So there's, you know, a lot of that exposure to various companies to uh, develop, you know, minerals that aren't owned by the surface owners. Correct. And this statute, though, is to provide some protection for the surface owner. That when these minerals are being developed, even though the minerals are owned by someone else because they were severed years and decades ago, this statute here, these statutes are to help the surface owner be compensated for the interruptions. Is there any length of time that this center of mineral ownership can exist, or is it forever? Well, that was an <coughs> earlier comment, I think, this afternoon, was that it can be terminated, if I understood the comment correctly, but generally the severed ownership is perpetual unless it's unused for 20 years and then the surface owner claims it. Do you have any idea how many um, uh, surface owners do not own minerals in the United States? Any idea? It's a very general statement that I hear when the question is asked as to how many severed mineral rights are there. And I need to dust off some cobwebs so that I can repeat the statement. Between the federal government, the state government, the railroad, about 50% of the minerals in western North Dakota are held by those three entities. And then when I make that comment, almost inevitably somebody towards the back of the room says, don't forget about the financial institutions that have retained minerals when they foreclosed the land and then sold off the surface rights and kept the mineral rights. Yeah. Uh, I would expect that there's people in this room that may have spent some time in the courtroom, courthouses looking at <coughs> mineral ownership and land ownership that can answer that question better than I can. I just have the general hearsay statements. Uh, it's my opinion, it's a big number. I think this is one of the things that should really be stressed in the eastern part of North Dakota people, because they, they look at us and say, oh, yeah, you own your garage or anything. Well, very few of us own them. Yeah. But they, the assumption is that, man, they're really breaking in the door. Right? <laughs> yeah. Other comments? Yes. I've got a question on compensation. There for a while, you know, the saltwater disposal were packed, and a lot of these guys, you know, a suspicion they probably weren't local truck drivers, but there's a lot of saltwater dumpings, and they'd load up a saltwater truck and just where they felt like dumping it, they would. On my property, they pulled up on a location, backed over the edge, and dumped it. They suspected two semi loads of saltwater. It was on an oasis location. 
And what kind of bothered me that the pumper didn't notice that like a thousand feet of trees that was killed in a draw. And they didn't recognize it. So I went and said, hey, you gotta compensate me or do something. So well, we'll clean it up. So they hired earth movers out of mine that did the anhydrous spill. They came up, did a pretty good job of cleaning it up, and they fenced me out of it so the pasture could rejuvenate again. And now they're saying it was a dumping, it wasn't a spill from us, and we're not gonna compensate you anything for that spill. And this has happened in three other locations. Is that fair for them to say, we're, you're lucky we cleaned it up for you, but it was off their location? A lawyer can't answer whether or not it's fair. That's for a politician to answer. <laughs> <laughs> a lawyer's comment is more of, is there a potential legal remedy? And it's probably going to end up sounding like a broken record this afternoon. But when somebody does something on my land without the legal right to do it, without my permission to do it, it's trespass and I have to go to court to prove the facts that they really did it to my land, and here are the damages under a trespass theory. And they never did know who done it, you know, just some, that's what they were saying. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and unfortunately, sometimes we don't know who pulled the trigger. Right. Exactly. So. Other questions or comments? Yes? About a year ago, I heard uh, there was a question about um, where, where you had earlier stated you own everything above your land and everything below your land in the center of the earth. And say in the pool area, you, the location is not on your property. And you own 40 acres in that pool area. And the well is drilled through your 40 acre track underground. So is that considered a pipeline? It's crossing your property, trespassing. But you're not paid for that pipeline underground, which is deeper down. They're actually producing the oil? Is that no, what they, they've crossed your property, whether, whether it's a dry pool or not, but they've crossed your property. You're, say you have 40 acres in the pooled area, they drill through your property, just say as if it was a pipeline, but it's deeper, but it's still crossing your property, as you stated earlier, you own everything to the center of the earth. So if they drill through your property, you can prove it through the state's, uh, uh, is that considered damages? It's not a trespass because what they're required to do is pay you for your portion of the minerals. They have to figure out who all owns the minerals within that 1,280 acre spacing unit and everybody who owns minerals within that 1,280 acres shares in the production from those 1,280 acres. Yes? Does that hold your lease? And your lease is with company A and company B is drilling the well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it holds your lease. Go ahead. That 20 year deal, does that, does that include state and federal mm -hmm. land? Mm -hmm. No. They own it forever. <laughs> <laughs> that 20 year of unused mineral interest being declared abandoned does not apply to the state. Other questions or comments? By the way, if I don't know the answer, I make one up. <laughs> you know how busy the courts are getting tied up with uh, cases right now? I would expect that the courts are going to get busier than they already are, and that, yeah, we're going to have a lot of litigation. Years in, or Pardon me? Three, four years to get a case heard and everything. The pipeline just or something like that. I would expect that it's going to vary from um, district court to district court. There are pleas in front of the legislature right now to see if we can't get some additional judges into these areas where there's rapid population growth and rapid growth in legal issues. So. Hopefully the legislature will listen to that and get a couple of judges that are additional judges to serve the western areas so we can keep these proceedings moving forward. The other alternative is to do your best to see if you can not come up with uh, negotiated settlements. I've been perfectly involved with several of these matters and 
almost always eventually settle. But it, it takes a little bit of pushing to... So it helps the final, like they say, go to the final and see it out. You betcha. <laughs> if, uh, and I'm not saying that to promote the, the business for lawyers. It does become a negotiating ploy that I'm serious. And if you don't want to deal with me, we will go to court. Can we negotiate water usage? When you look at mineral leases, you look at surface agreements, especially in other states, there's oftentimes some type of a question as to whether or not the surface owner or the mineral owner can grant the mineral developer the right to use water. Uh, North Dakota really doesn't give the mineral owner or the min surface owner that type of legal authority. Uh, all water in North Dakota is owned by the state of North Dakota. And all water in North Dakota is used by the permission of the state. So if I grant you permission to use water on my land, that's really quite worthless in North Dakota. The only way for you to get permission to use water that happens to be located on my land is to get that permission from the state. Okay? Does that include stock dams? Yep. All water in North Dakota is owned by the state of North Dakota. You need an explicit permit to use the water, permit from the state, except if you're drilling a domestic well, a well for livestock, including a stock pond, and a well or pond for recreational purposes. And even if those get to be more than 12 and a half acre feet of water in a year's time, you still need a permit for those. So all water in North Dakota is owned by the state of North Dakota, and you need permission from the state to use that water. You get to a state like Texas, where in Texas, groundwater is owned by the surface owner. So if a mineral developer wants to use groundwater in Texas, they have to get permission from the surface owner. That type of a paragraph really has no meaning in a North Dakota mineral lease. <laughs> yes? Does North Dakota own Lake Sakakawea? Owns the water in it. No question about it. Uh, and, the and the federal government even backed off on that one. Oh. Was there a bill that they just introduced about putting a tax on it? 11% or something? Yep. On all water for anyone? Uh, yeah. yeah. The question is, is there going to be a tax possibly imposed on what, Lake Sakakawea water? I don't know what it was. All water. Or all water used by the oil I industry? It, I think it was defeated in but, but that's what that is. All, all water. All industrial water. All industrial water. Okay. The okay. question that is asked then is the cleanup. After these wells, and it might be decades until these wells are no longer producing, or <coughs> some of these wells might go out of production fairly soon and are replaced by other wells, uh, but the question still is the cleanup of these wells and the uh, mineral developer, the oil company, is to clean up the well site, plug the wells, and the industrial commission has a responsibility for overseeing that that cleanup is occurring. Okay. But it doesn't hurt to, when you're negotiating this surface compensation agreement with the mineral developer, Remind them in your own agreement that, by the way, when you're done with this well, whether it's next year or 20 years from now, you still have a responsibility of cleaning it up. The, the real bite to enforce that is going to come from the state, but I would say it doesn't hurt to remind them that you're thinking about it as well. Yes? On, on reclamation of oil sites, how long does that, now that, let's say that the the lease is held by production, and it's happening right now. The first well is now not in production. 
but it's being held in production by another well, but that particular site now is not active anymore. Do they have to reclaim that within the same limits, or is it still, do you understand what I'm saying? They've actually, some of the first wells that they drilled here, you know, they shot them down within three to four years, but it's still being held by production. The Industrial Commission doesn't care whether the mineral rights are being held by production. They care about whether or not this well is producing. So your question of, we have a well that's been producing, another well beside it is also producing, the first well is shut down. From the mineral owner's perspective, my mineral rights are still locked into this lease because there is the second well that continues to pump. Does that relieve the company or give the company some additional time of cleaning up the first well? No, that doesn't change it at all. The Industrial Commission doesn't care about whether or not there's a mineral lease being held. They care about whether or not this well is pumping. And once that well is not pumping, you've got to go by the regulations to get it cleaned up. Whose responsibility is to clean up the site that the company went broke or let the country broke? Industrial Commission needs to step in. That's the responsibility of the state to step in. And I don't, I'm not sure if the state's ready to take on all of that responsibility, but the only provisions that we have right now, it essentially shifts it to the state. It's the Industrial Commission that needs to get it cleaned up, get it plugged to make sure, for example, that water isn't going down there, or something's not coming out and contaminating a water source that that well's getting plugged, and then the Industrial Commission needs to try its best to get the money out of the responsible party. Don't they have to pull the bond first? Uh, you're asking some questions that I don't remember the answers to. I do believe there is. There is. But I, and I know we had it up to so there is there is a bond. It wasn't um, very much. Five times is rather block away than yeah. get the bond yeah. much. There is a bond that the mineral developer needs to post so that the state can draw on those funds to cover up some or to cover some problems if problems arise in the future. But as the suggestion was offered here, sometimes those bonds aren't enough to to cover the costs. Other questions or comments? Go ahead. There was a case where they drilled a well it's in the lake now in Scotia, but they drilled it on the other side when it was drilled before the lake was out there. Okay. And the outfit that drilled it went broke. And the state, I think, had to draw the plug down. But they did it on the ice. It was quite a, quite a deal. So even if it's a difficult well to plug, the state is expected to step forward and plug the well. On divisional orders, how long can an oil company drag their feet on sending you a divisional order after the well is drilled and completed and produced? I don't remember. Um, there are regulations under the Industrial Commission for those type of details, and I don't know all of those details. So. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 150 days from the day of production. 150 days? But they can drag it out as long as they want, as long as they pay you interest from that day. Only if you request your interest. If you request your interest, yeah. They're supposed to, and a lot won't unless you ask them. You people know those details far better than I do. <laughs> and on the division order, they try to get you to, again, warranty the title or guarantee the title. Cross it off and void it out or something. Yes on your uh, documents that in, uh, state that you are guaranteed that you are the owner of the minerals and so forth, you are absolutely correct. Cross out that language. You do not want to warrant that I own these minerals because uh, sometimes we think we own the minerals and we might not. So don't make any of those type of promises or guarantees or warrants within your uh, documents. Good suggestion. Go ahead. Uh, to go along with that, David, the question on the division orders, usually what happens, the oil company will find some particular title defect that then will start the clock over at some future time. So even though maybe the regulation is 150 days, they will find some title difficulty. When you get that cleared up, then the 150 days starts over again. So it's 
a little bit fuzzy as to the actual time requirement because there's usually some way around that. Okay. Um, How about the oil companies? Do they always account for every mineral acre under that spacing? They're supposed to. How would you find out if they do? Uh, that's all going to be public information again with the Industrial Commission. It is? Yes, that's all public information. Because we were discussing this when they went through on the reservoir, now they did the high water mark. They say more or less. You want to do your. Well, oh. but we say more or less on just about every document. Oh. I'm leasing you 80 acres more or less, I'm selling you 320 acres more or less. That's just standard language of more or less. See, you probably find that on most deeds and in most leases. Along the lines of that uh, continuation of searching for ownership of minerals, they, they're starting to come up with now, your grandmother was born in 1880. How do we know she's dead? We're going to be a world record on that. <laughs> Uh, I, I, it's as silly as it sounds. <laughs> That's just a lawyer doing his or her job. But I say covered. Uh, um, no, we, we do need to be a little more formal with some of our family transactions than we perhaps were in the past. We need to make sure that the death certificates are prepared at the time of grandma's passing, even though we've all attended the funeral, and make sure that we have a couple of copies of that death certificate available, or that it is a matter of public record. We can go get another death certificate from the state records so that we can prove that documentation. Uh, as silly as it sounds, um, we do need to have those documents. Are we answering some of the types of questions that you wanted answered this afternoon, or are we missing the boat? Oh, no, very well. Yes. You know, I, I have found out through experience, like where you were talking out of the uh, abandoned wells, okay, it is awfully easy for the oil company to say, uh, no, we haven't really abandoned that. It's just temporarily abandoned. We want to have the opportunity to see in the future if it uh, makes sense to go back in. And if the landowner does not go to the Industrial Commission and, you know, complain and say, look, that has not paid for X number of years or whatever, and do something about it, it's awful easy for the industrial commission to just continue to grant them temporarily abandonment status for a well. But once the landowner makes the complaint, then they have to they have to act on it, and they have to have a reasonable reason. Otherwise, they have to go in there and abandon it and clean and re reclaim the location. The comment essentially reinforces the idea that uh, property owners, whether you own mineral rights or you own surface rights, property owners are expected to protect their property rights. And that is a fundamental concept within our legal system and within our society. So if I am the mineral owner and I've leased the minerals to a mineral developer, the mineral developer has a producing well, Obviously, that lease agreement continues as long as that well is producing. If that well is no longer producing, then that, well, then that lease terminates. Who needs to push the issue as to whether or not that lease terminates? It's the mineral owner. It's not going to be the state. It's not going to be anybody else. But it's, you, have, you have a situation where, okay, you have two wells under the same... Uh, production agreement, if the one well has been abandoned or at least temporarily abandoned for a period of time, you still have the right to make that company come in there and reclaim that uh, location. Yes, and I, that was part of what we were mentioning a few moments ago, that even though there are two wells, one is no longer producing, the second well is enough to continue to hold the mineral lease, 
there's still an obligation to get that first well plucked up and cleaned up. How often does the well have to produce the whole leaf? <laughs> that was a question that was asked yesterday. It caused me to quickly do some relearning this morning. <laughs> the term that we wanted to use yesterday, and I couldn't recall it, is paying quantities. As long as the well is producing paying quantities, the lease continues. Well, paying quantities, that's not five barrels a day, or I mean, we, we haven't specified it. We specify a concept. And this is again where the lawyers unfortunately get involved. But now you need to take that concept and apply it to the situation. Part of determining whether the amount being produced meets the standard of a paying quantity, it is economics. What is the value of the oil being produced and what is the cost of continuing to operate that well? And if we run into a situation where we're losing money because it costs more to operate that well than the value of the oil being produced, it's not paying quantities. So there is a profit consideration in trying to apply that concept. The second part then is exactly what you asked, and that is how often do we need to have this paying quantities? Unfortunately, that should be negotiated with the mineral lease. <laughs> Four years ago. Four years ago. <laughs> Uh, and it's, we can chuckle about it, but it is, you know, it, it, it is, uh, it, it, it might be a, a sad situation in some cases because we don't have that level of definition within our agreements. And you're going to get sick and tired of me telling you what the ultimate solution is probably going to be. You might end up litigating it. I have heard of an oil company tried to say any production, they were claiming they could hold a location with production of salt water. And yeah. That was changed. There are some yeah. amendments to it since. No, I can see the concept of having to hold to, to a little lot of production, just to hold them in the middle of the system. I want to come back and read their own. Yeah. At different levels. At a different level. Yeah. 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 So if you can get a release, you got all on levels released. Yeah. The mineral owners are going to want to protect their, monitor and protect their mineral interests very carefully. No different than the surface owner that leases to a tenant that you keep an eye on. What is the tenant doing with your property? And uh, you, you, you check on it occasionally. It might be a little easier to check on the surface because I can drive out to the edge of the field and look at the pasture or the field and see what's going on. Uh, but the mineral owner is going to have to become uh, sophisticated enough or informed enough that they can continue to track what's happening with their mineral development, the minerals that are being produced, and if they're not comfortable with what's happening, start talking to your tenant, that is the mineral developer. Yes? What's your interpretation of the old uh, the late rental or more contained cash? person uh, continuing to produce uh, the lease. Now the, the, thought, the comment is um, the point of if the well's no longer producing, but I still pay you some royalty just so that I can continue the lease. Um, that is provided for in some of the mineral leases. I would, again, as a mineral owner, be very carefully thinking about, do I agree with that, and do I want that as part of my mineral agreement, my mineral lease agreement. Um, some situations, it might be that some mineral owner said, yeah, I'm comfortable with receiving a relatively small cash payment on a regular basis, even though the minerals aren't being produced, and if that ties up the lease, the next mineral owner might look at that as the exact same term and say, I'm no way interested in having that type of a situation. Now that's going to be, again, 
up to each property owner, mineral owner, to decide how they want to handle that. So, so if you have a spacing unit and half of the people decide that they want to take money and the other half don't, so then where, where do you uh, end up? The leases are lost on the one because it's not producing and the other ones are still... Even one could take it to court, couldn't he? Very likely. Yeah, the one of the people that wants the, the uh, lease terminated I'd have to go in the corner and think about that question. I hadn't thought about that. I'll, I'll write that one down so I have something to think about the next time I'm driving up and have a half hour, hour to myself and then I, I, I can't comment on because I don't have enough, enough insight on that one to answer that one. I'm failing all of your questions, aren't I? <laughs> Any other questions? Just when they drag our, their feet on not on paying you the first time or something, we can go to the Industrial Commission on that, can't we? Contact them? Or? You can contact the Industrial Commission on these matters. Uh, now, there's going to be times when the Industrial Commission is going to respond saying, yes, we can uh, put some pressure on the mineral developers because they're not following the regulations that the state has in place as to how the mineral company has to operate. There's going to be other times when the mineral owner is going to raise a question and the industrial commission is going to say sorry we don't have any authority over that particular issue yeah. so uh, if you're not sure as to whether or not the industrial commission has the authority contact the industrial commission and let them tell you no yeah. that's fair then. yes what can you tell us about being a participating mineral owner You don't want to lease it. The minerals are going to get developed anyway. So the question then becomes, do you want to be a partial owner of the well, or do you want to go ahead and enter into a lease and act like any other tenant? or any other mineral owner that has leased uh, to that mineral developer. If you decide to share in the ownership of the well, and you'll have that small fractional <coughs> ownership, you are entitled to a royalty payment, but you also have to pay your share of the operating costs for that well, plus a penalty for not having been at the part of that well from the beginning. So, uh, you know, there are probably some people in this room, there are probably people throughout the community that have decided to share in the ownership of the, the well, uh, but do your homework ahead of time and make sure you know what you're getting into because it, there are some costs associated with being a partial owner of the well. Does it work to set up a limited liability corporation and put it in then so you kind of indemnify yourself? Say if things go wrong and you get in this. Should I set up a corporation and put that interest in that corporation that if something goes backwards um, uh, that I'm uh, protected from liability? Just like any corporation, whether for any, well, any type of a business. If you develop a corporation and it's underfunded to begin with, the courts have the legal authority to pass right through that organization and bring the personal liability right back to you. So you need to at least have enough resources in that type of a business organization to cover your risks up front. So again, you need to know what you're doing. You, de you need to get some fairly sophisticated legal counsel to help you with some, some of those questions. Somebody who knows a heck of a lot more than I do. How much more time do you want to spend? How many more questions do you want to ask? We got preliminary division orders for our lots in town, which is in section 18. And on the division order, it said that it was two section spacing, but 
but it was not 1,280 acres. There were 30 or 40 acres missing out of that uh, spacing. Where did those acres go to? Did anybody else notice that on your on your lot division orders? <coughs> 618 now the government lots on it. Because section. Yeah. 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 Section 18 shouldn't have lots, correct? Yeah. Section 18 shouldn't have lots, correct? Yeah. Question is who is the street? Should be on the west side of the challenge. My lot. I don't know. Uh, I I I'm only familiar with the correction line on the top of Keenan and Hawkeye Ho Townships, 152.95 and 96, and that adds acres, acres to it. So there's 1,400 acres in the 1,280 space. Uh, I would... I could see where you could be off a few acres from 1,280 acres for a variety of reasons. But if you're beginning to be 30 to 40 acres off, I think that's a good signal. Ask some questions. I have calling from Zoomfield, but it's never the right person that I talk to. Yeah. They're, they're going to call me back someday. Sure. Sir? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, she can go up to the tax director and ask how many acres are in this particular section that you're referring to. That's what we do on our 1280s down there, to find out exactly how many mineral or how many acres are on that 1280. Yeah. Be up to, there could be up to 10 12. acres on a correction line yeah. off one section. Your register the tax director and ask for how many acres are in that section. Yeah. Your, your county register of deeds along with the tax, tax in authority in your county uh, should be able to help you with some of that as well. Thank you. Man, you said Atlas. I worked on County Atlas. Look, that's just all square miles. They're, just, they're not going to be accurate like the courthouse. Yeah, you know. But they, they show the lot acreages yeah. in, in the one <coughs> on the north correction line. They show Other questions? Have we answered your questions? Yes. It's been a long afternoon. You people have been very patient. I got a quick question. Is anyone along the reservoir from like